This meeting is now being recorded. Good day and welcome to the Partners in Care Module 1, Integrated Care and the Need for Community in Addressing Serious Mental Illness. As you will notice, all participants have been muted. If you have a question to ask, please submit your question in the Q&A pane, the icon of which can be located on the bottom of your Zoom window. Your questions will be answered after today's presentation. If you have any technical issues, please send a chat to all panelists and hosts, the directions of which can be found in the chat window. Thank you all for joining, and please welcome Dr. Afzal Javed, the president of WPA. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, dear friends, members of Fountain House committees, participants, and mental health professionals who are coming from different disciplines. It is indeed a great day for Fountain House New York and equally for World Psychiatric Association for this joint initiative that was started by Fountain House to highlight the importance of care model and the issues how we should reintegrate mentally ill who are recovered, our service users, our clients back to the community. I think all of you know that mental health problems constitute a big burden, but unfortunately, mental health services are not getting is share what we really need to have on the basis of the disabilities that we treat, manage, or care. The idea of this module and the series of modules came from the work of an advisory committee that was constituted by Fountain House New York and World Psychiatric Association were the pioneers in terms of setting up that committee in collaboration with many other stakeholders, including WHO. The purpose that, and the objectives that came out of our deliberations was to prepare a series of modules to help mental health professionals, and non-mental health professionals so that they can recognize, manage, and effectively treat mentally ill within a perspective of partners in care. We are grateful to the organizers of this Congress, these, these webinars, and we hope that this educational program will be very helpful for mental health professionals and everyone who is interested in the care of mentally ill all over the globe. I am also pleased to announce that these webinars will get WPA's accredited CPD hours and the managing people of these webinars will be able to send those CPD certificates to the participants of these modules. I once again thank all of you, and especially the Fountain House New York. The team has done an exceptional work and World Psychiatric Association look forward for having further collaborations and links because we believe we should stand for our patients, we should stand by our clients, and we should support the service users 
so that they can play an effective role in the community. Thank you very much. Dr. C, I'll now pass the call over to you. I believe you may be muted. There you go, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Javed, for hosting what we hope is a very uh, important and uh, uh, systems-changing conference for, uh, for mental health across the world. I think um, all of us hope to better integrate care, to better serve our patients, and we want to present to you today an exciting curriculum that's been developed by an international collaboration um, to try to further these goals. Um, I am Jeannie C. I'm a, a psychiatrist and the medical director of Fountain House. I have had the great privilege of taking this job over from my predecessor, Dr. Ralph Aquila, who had assembled this international team of experts to develop this curriculum. And um, I am really proud to introduce uh, to you our panel today, which I will do later. But first, we have a very special guest today, Dr. Mary Doherty, who is the Deputy Medical Director of South London and Maudsley uh, NHS Foundation Trust and the Clinical and Strategic Director of the Royal College of Psychiatrists Center for Quality Improvement. She comes to us as an expert in integrated care in its many forms. Um, our field has tried for a long time to rectify the issue of um, people, uh, of psychiatrists really, looking at um, mental health as a, um, as a neck up issue and um, not considering the whole person um, and the needs of the whole person when we talk about recovery of people with mental illnesses and serious mental illnesses. But a lot of work has been done in this area and Dr. Doherty has been a major um, expert in discussing uh, and, and looking at all of the forms of integrated care uh, that have been tried. And today, um, I'm really pleased that she's going to introduce our, um, our webinar. Uh, Dr. Doherty? Jeannie, thank you so much. Um, and that was an incredibly kind and probably overly generous introduction. It's wonderful to be here in the room with you all. Um, I'm, in addition to the roles that Jeannie said, I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist. I work with people in South East London. I deliver an integrated care service which provides mental health and um, social support for people living with heart failure and COPD. And Jeannie actually used the words I wanted to use about being here, which is excited and privileged. Um, I wasn't going to share this, but I decided I would just now. Fountain House, um, when I first encountered Fountain House during a visit to New York a couple of years ago, when I left my first day with the team, I actually felt tearful. I felt tearful because I saw in Fountain House what good care looks like, what you can actually do. If you flip the switch from thinking about a truly medical model and working with people to create community and support them where they are. Um, so it's a true privilege um, to be here with you all today and to introduce this first module. And being honest, I'm a little bit jealous about this opportunity because you're gonna access ideas, resources, concepts, and conversations that I really wish I had had access to when I was training to be a psychiatrist. Because the ideas and approaches that you're gonna hear about some of today are the solutions to many of the things that health professionals such as myself know are missing when we're working to try and find the best support for the people that we care for. And I suspect many of us on this call have something in common, and that's probably a shared belief that we think that if you have a serious mental illness, you should have access to the support you need to have a rich and fulfilling life, a life filled with love, security, friendship, meaningful and rewarding activity and health in its fullest sense. And this module on integrated care is going to touch on some of the changes going on internationally across our health and care systems. In integrated care comes in many different shapes and sizes. There's different models, there's different settings, different initiatives for different populations. 
But underpinning all of integrated care is the attempt to redress the fact that we, health professionals, policymakers, and organizations that influence and fund health and care systems, we didn't get it right. Things have been set up in a way that means that it's really hard if you have serious mental illness to get holistic support that responds to you and all of your needs as a whole person. It's really hard to get access to services that recognize that a safe and stable home, friendship, company, activity are as important to your health as your blood pressure or the treatments that you may be engaging with or using for psychosis. We can't separate mental, physical and social well-being or the communities that we come from and exist within. And we did make mistakes when we designed our services. We underestimated how important community and other social determinants are to health. And integrated care has got to try and overcome big structural barriers like payment models, training, um, our different professional sects that get in the way of creating services, pathways and partnerships that connect everything up, the mental, the physical, the social and the community. Now, research into integrated care that connects mental health and physical health is really well established. There's libraries of the stuff. Um, and it concludes that integrating care is better than providing siloed care. It works. It works for everyone. It works for service users and it also works the staff delivering it. And research on integrating community interventions or psychosocial interventions into models that deliver also mental and physical health is really there, but it's lagging behind a little and it's actually slightly harder to navigate. And there are lots of reasons why the research base is harder to navigate. And one of them is because there's so many different types of models or permutations of what you can do. And also often those people delivering community programs just aren't as well set up to be part of research or using um, measurement outcomes to help them contribute to that evidence base. But it's a really flourishing field and I hope you'll look further into it when you finish this module or perhaps, perhaps contribute to it yourself. Now this module comes at a really important time as across the international community there is real growing recognition that we need to do things differently. We need to make supports and services available that respond to the whole person and meet them where they are in their community. Researchers, policymakers, service user groups, community organizations and health professionals are all nudging forward this agenda and changes to address and try and overcome some of the structural barriers to integration. And the research so far tells us that integrating care is hard, but it is worth it. And it's hard because it means we all have to work a little bit differently. And I hope after hearing about this work, it will inspire you to be part of a movement of people who commit to working differently, to ensure that those living with serious mental illness have real opportunities to get the supports and opportunities they deserve. And I really hope you enjoy the next hour and thank you for letting me be here with you. Thank you so much, Mary, and thank you for, for visiting us uh, to really learn about what Fountain House is and what, uh, what the clubhouse model can uh, offer around the world. Um, with hundreds of clubhouses around the world, I think um, it, it's become a tidal wave where we hope to bring community into medicine and have partnerships uh, where we really can serve as many people with quality mental health care as possible. Well, I'm really proud to um, introduce our panel today. Uh, kicking us off will be Dr. Kevin Rice, uh, who's the Director of Research at Fountain House, um, and he will talk about uh, integrated care and set us up for um, uh, to really learn about what Clubhouse uh, can do um, as part of the integrated care model. Uh, this is a, uh, the first in three modules, a three module series, and uh, the next two modules on um, April 21st and 28th will be about um, the, uh, the number two, uh, uh, the second seminar will be about uh, the clubhouse module uh, described more fully. And the third will be about how psychiatrists can partner with clubhouses and vice versa, and, and how uh, we can really have a collaboration that uh, furthers the quality of care. But today uh, we're gonna focus on integrated care with Kevin. And after Kevin uh, speaks and, and I make some comments about uh, clubhouses, we have Craig Bayer, who is a member of Fountain House and the editor and founder of the Fountain House Roar Journal, an international publication. Uh, he will speak uh, to his own experience. 
Um, and also joining us are Francesca Pernice, who's the Associate Professor of Educational Psychology at Wayne State University, and Lori D'Angelo, who is uh, the Executive Director of Magnolia Clubhouse in Ohio. Uh, supporting us all in coordinating this effort is Kinga Yenjechuk, who's the Associate Director of Partnership Development at Fountain House. Um, and not with us today, unfortunately, is Cyrus Napolitano, who has been uh, central to this work as well. And he's a member of Fountain House and co-director of the Clubhouse New York Coalition. Uh, so we will all be uh, uh, joining in the panel discussion later. But first, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Kevin. Thank you, Dr. C. Um, and I will be leading us through our slide deck that kind of provides a synopsis and summary of what we hope to really kind of encapsulate module one within and the content within. I do want to highlight that this is a three module program and really module one is really to do some table setting and doing some case making for the things that will come after in module two and module three. And that case making exercise is really that community is going to be one of those kind of the third leg of the stool or the you know the the third leg of whatever support system that you need to have when you are trying to develop integrated care strategies specifically around um, serious mental disorders um, and then module two is really going to be about okay so when you bring in that community integration what actually happens in those community operations as uh, Dr. Uh, Do Doherty uh, mentioned uh, one of the biggest barriers uh, to, and um, identified in integrated care research is the lack of knowledge of what happens in your partners and the understanding of what they do in their operations and we hope that module two kind of helps provide that kind of understanding and insight that then sets up module three, which is really about um, the strategies of like, okay, now that we've made the case, now that we know what happens in these community um, settings and the types of unique contributions they can um, um, bring to the table, what does it look like for you as a healthcare professional when you are wanting to interact and maybe adapt or um, grow your practice to have better kind of close relations with uh, kind of community partners and your network? And then what is the role of community partners and those healthcare professionals distinctly and in collaboration with one another. But today we're going to be focusing on module one, which is uh, uh, going to be uh, focused on the kind of the community dynamics and the positioning within integrated care strategies um, across the world. So with that, I can go to the next slide. We can get things started. So uh, the main thing that we really, really want to emphasize here is that this curriculum is um, at its outset designed to train psychiatrists and mental health professionals and the principles and models of integrated care for persons with histories of um, severe mental disorders. Um, and that we really want to highlight the integration of community-based supports with these kind of more traditional models that people may be more familiar with, with integrated care strategies that emphasize medical and psychiatric coordination. But we really want to add that third leg, as I mentioned, into the mix. Uh, but we also believe that this can be used beyond just the training and um, utility for psychiatrists and mental health professionals, but also for lay professionals that are maybe working in um, places like the lower and middle income um, worlds where maybe the primary providers in those settings are community providers or lay professionals or kind of fan, friends and families, but they're looking to grow and expand um, those services around a basis of community support and justifying how you can do that and how you can maybe bring more supports around with that foundation of the community already there. And that you don't necessarily need to maybe have those foundations of psychiatric and medical infrastructure present in order to explore, provide meaningful care and support within um, certain settings where the community supports are the primary focus. Can we go to the next slide? So uh, moving into module one, as I mentioned, we're going to be focusing on integrated care and the need for community and addressing severe mental disorders. So with that, we'll get started. Um, so the learning objectives are to describe the initiative of integrated care strategies, address um, and how they um, seek to address the comorbidity of physical and behavioral health uh, and their chronicity um, across time. Um, two is to review the comorbidity and mortality impacts of SMD. Um, and we, when, we're, when I use SMD or when you see it, that we're just seeing um, severe mental disorders. Um, and three, describe the impact of unaddressed social supports in SMD. So, um, and moving us into then four, identify the role of community models of care in addressing the needs and vulnerabilities of persons with histories of SMD. Next slide, please. All right, let's get started. So we're gonna keep going. So uh, just to kind of a little bit of background, which uh, Dr. Do um, Dokerty kind of really helped um, set us up for, but we really wanna highlight 
um, the idea and the initiative and vision behind integrated care strategy and its growing saliency and rising star and priority that's happening in the global mental health discussion and in different kind of innovative services that are being looked to be developed around the world. And, you know, we kind of, you know, there was efforts and strategies before, but we really see the 2016 World Health Organization um, kind of as the impetus of really making the stake in the claim around integrated care strategies, as really seeking to look for um, collaboration of care across partners in order to address the continuum of needs that occur within different settings, moving from uh, you know, medical to psychiatric to palliative, all different types of health sectors to in order to get that kind of comprehensive experience that we um, see as being really effective when um, versus when things are happening in a siloed fashion or in a more kind of fragmented system. Um, um, and we really see that this need for integrated care was, you know, a growing out of a greater recognition that um, the, there is a greater growing persistence of chronic disease burden between mental health and physical health disorders. And that these things often reciprocally impact one another. And, you know, the search for, oh, if we address this one first, then it will impact that one. Or if we don't address, you know, the, the simultaneity and the parallel need of having to have kind of, uh, you know, in, in tandem treatment and models and strategies for addressing these things was really what integrated care was setting about for itself um, and trying to solve the problems of comorbidity between mental and physical health disorders. Next slide, please. So within integrated care, as Dr. Doherty mentioned, uh, there's a lot of different models out there. Uh, you know, they range from various types of systems of kind of just basic level service coordination and information sharing. Some models use co-location. Some are fully integrated and using the same operations and, you know, are basically in the same space and using the same uh, kind of care strategies. And they build those models, not just as separate systems interacting with one another, but a shared system from their inception. Um, but, you know, we use as reference and just talking about integrated care, we go through this more in the text and the recommended readings of the training itself. Um, but we use the kind of the SAMHSA model as kind of highlighting here in the United States, some of the kind of various kind of levels or strategies of integrated care moving across kind of different types of coordinated strategies, co-location strategies, and full-on integration. And there's different levels of systems. And there's been a really robust amount of research that's looked into the efficacy of these various kind of models as they have sought to kind of address the comorbidity circumstances that was really kind of, you know, given that impact and um, priority within that World Health Organization um, invective, but also um, what we're seeing kind of a growing interest um, and the global mental health um, world writ large. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as I was just mentioning, you know, uh, and Dr. Dr. D also mentioned, uh, there's an increase in mental health accessibility when we're seeing when integrated strategies are able to kind of come to the fore. Um, there are clinically meaningful improvements that alleviate the symptoms in both short and long term, um, increasing the satisfaction with care and greater quality of life. And there is also just operational and process metrics that are really improved, such as shorter referral delays, reduced time and treatment, higher quality of life, positive treatment experiences, fewer appointments, and lower overall treatment costs. There's a bevy of things that have been identified that when integrated care is operating successfully, that they um, we see real meaningful impact and outcomes than when they are operating separately. Um, and then there's also this effectiveness in addressing the comorbidity of mental illness and substance use disorders, which is, you know, something that we'll get to kind of talk a little bit about further today um, as well when we get into some of the kind of community dynamics and some of those social support programs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, but with the given, uh, okay, that's okay, you can go back to the previous slide. Um, but given the, you know, the, the objectives and needs for uh, integrated care and looking at kind of comorbidity uh, strategies, we really think that those needs are um, really felt acutely within um, uh, the experience of severe mental disorders and, the, and, and especially for the persons with the histories of severe mental disorders trying to navigate those systems. So you can go to that next slide now. Um, so, if we have as our kind of goal, our best practice recommendations, these integrated care strategies in order to address the comorbidity needs of any person, but uh, we feel that they're really acutely felt those needs for people with severe mental disorders and that um, when we look at them in the literature and we look at um, in, the, in the research, we see much higher, greater health disparities, um, especially with physical health disparities for people with severe mental health disorders, especially compared to general population or just other comparable comorbid circumstances. We also see very much higher poor quality of care 
and as well as significant higher costs for people with severe mental disorders. And you, when we look at the um, WHO's premature death among people with severe mental disorders, we see almost a 10 to 15, sometimes 10 to 25 years um, earlier death and mortality rates um, compared to the general population, which is highly significant. And the vast majority of these deaths are due to chronic physical and medical conditions such as cardiovascular, respiratory, and infectious disease, diabetes, hypertension, and suicide. So if we are really taking kind of the integrated care strategy at its face value of what it's setting out itself to do, we really see that, you know, and addressing the needs of people with severe mental disorders, that need is really acutely felt. And we really need to come, um, kind of be also thinking about those, the severity and the acuteness of those needs when developing these strategies in order to bring integrated care to its kind of full effectiveness for the people that need it the most. Next slide, please. But when we look at the kind of uh, um, interactions that people with severe mental disorders might have with care systems, let alone integrated care systems, we see that there's a lot of treatment gap all around the world. Um, and that especially this is true in low and middle income countries where between 76% to 85% of people with mental disorders receive no treatment whatsoever. And that even in um, you know, developed nations where we do maybe have more robust uh, um, healthcare infrastructure, there's typically no more than 10 psychiatrists per 100,000 people. And so even though we have these integrated care strategies and these concepts, as Dr. Abzal mentioned, um, we uh, have a very low investment in resource available ability, um, even though our concepts may be really sound and how we choose to kind of approach this. And this is definitely true within the lower and middle income countries. And, you know, we also kind of want to make a case in this training that, you know, some of that low interaction with general healthcare might also be because some of the other needs that are maybe more salient and primary are not being addressed first or the kind of distrust or mistrust that might be happening or occurring with those um, other traditional healthcare systems are, are compromising people's willingness or interest in interacting with those systems. And that we you know we'll be making the kind of this kind of case later that the ability for community interventions and dynamics to come in and intervene at that level to then re be rebuild that trust or offer trust brokerage and connections back into integrated care services or serve as a hub for developing other care services around can really serve as a really clear model for both um, um, circumstances, uh, both uh, uh, um, healthcare environments that have established psychiatric, medical, and community-based programs, or maybe um, environments that maybe only have community-based programs but are looking to develop better care systems around those community-based programs, like in the developing um, world. Uh, okay, let's keep going to the next slide. So this is where we're kind of going to make that pivot. So in understanding and identifying um, you know, the integrated care strategy, its objectives for comorbidity and the chronicity between uh, mental health conditions and physical health, um, we really see that there's, with severe mental disorders, that there's a more, a plus added beyond just those kind of traditional kind of care models. And that contemporary understandings of, of serious mental disorders um, have been really growing and, and expanded, especially over the past couple of decades, to really understand that it really doesn't follow a single course or kind of um, uh, etiology of kind of uh, the, the, the disease or the treatment cycle or what people's needs are. And it's not just about interacting kind of what we might imagine um, tr traditional kind of disease prevention might look like in kind of a medical model. And, you know, both quantitative and qualitative studies have really been showing that um, SMD outcomes are really tied to a recovery of dignity, hope, self-direction, a coherent sense of identity, social relationships, and an achievement of quality of life. Things that, you know, traditionally are not necessarily present within the care services that are typically operating within integrated care strategies and models. And there's a real, you know, emphasis that there's a necessity of looking at SMD beyond just the positive symptom remission or just decreasing medical um, uh, morbidities. And that, and if we really want to, and that really there could be a vicious cycle that by not addressing those other social needs, you may actually be undoing the work that you're achieving in those physical um, health settings or in those behavioral health settings because you're bringing people, your people are returning or going back to um, environments that are exacerbating their circumstances or their symptoms that is just kind of undoing maybe the progress is that you're experiencing. And so we need that kind of comprehensive care so that we're not just operating within a redundancy of kind of care experiences or putting a ceiling or a limit on the type of things that people can really achieve or seek to um, uh, grow within as they pursue their recovery and their trajectory and managing um, severe mental disorders. Next slide, please. So um, we really want to emphasize in this module, and we'll be talking about this uh, also in module two, is that, you know, there's been 
although there hasn't been a whole lot of research of community programming within integrated care, so to speak, there has been a lot of research on some of the things that community programs directly seek to address, which is the impacts of isolation and loneliness in SMD and on for those populations. And what we see is that, you know, people with SMD experience loneliness twice as much compared to the general population. Um, but that this relationship between, you know, psychosis and loneliness, what comes first? Is there this synergy between this, this kind of syndemic effect that's happening? It's not completely fully understood. Some people you know, um, kind of attribute like social adversity theory and early development linking loneliness experiences to increasing chance uh, risk of psychosis. So you're uh, having kind of high isolation and, you know, um, very kind of risk averse behaviors early on in your life because of either traumas or very high risk environments that then leads you to kind of withdraw, which then exacerbate, you know, risk factors for psychosis later on in life. But then there's also indications that positive and negative symptoms in SMD, you know, lead people to seek to withdraw because of either experiences of stigma, of feeling misunderstood or not accepted, and also uh, really having a diminished sense of being othered. I mean, that then leads to withdrawing that then creates it's a kind of a loneliness post the onset of the psychosis or the condition itself, which then probably leads into a feedback loop of reinforcing those symptoms and in and of itself and kind of having this, you know, cyclical effect that in this kind of centrifugal um, interaction between the circumstances of isolation, loneliness, and the conditions of SMD. So, you know, what we see with these um, the, these experiences of social withdrawal and loneliness is that the things that we are trying to address in physical health and behavioral health ultimately get impacted in a very negative action, such as the maladaptive social beliefs that we might be trying to address in behavioral health, um, the exacerbation of positive and negative symptoms, poor quality of life, risk of psychiatric hospitalization, poor physical health, and an increased risk of all the different types of cardiovascular and high mortality related comorbidities um, that we are seeing with hypertension, diabetes, inflammatory disease and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. So we are looking for strategies in transition, right? You know, if we limit ourselves with our integrated care strategies as being only psychiatric and medical, you know, we may find ourselves that we are really not meeting the some of the core and arguably maybe some of the foundational social needs of persons with SMD that is maybe even undermining the progress or efforts that we are trying to do in those other sectors. And by not addressing them, we see that there's somewhat, in some cases, in the United States and in other parts of the world, that there's a parity to these old medical model systems in the 1950s to what a lot of people are experiencing today, where maybe they do get access or they are given access to psychiatric or medical care, but they are usually left to languish in very poor social conditions. And, and here in the United States, quite often that is either sometimes the criminal justice system, the homelessness system, um, homeless system, and, you know, we see a lot of kind of uh, our kind of regression and the type of kind of progress that we are wanting to achieve or arguably trying to achieve. And what we want to make the case for in this module and this kind of table setting is that when you add the community component, you're really going to see a synergistic impact and effect across all the different integrated care strategies. So, and uh, next slide, please. So in setting this table around kind of integrated care, what its objectives were, what it was seeking to achieve, but then also adding in this other kind of component of community um, kind of correspondence between those care partners, we really think that we can really start to formulate a better sense of that comprehensive picture that both Dr. C and Dr. Doherty were mentioning um, at, the, at the start of this. And we see this as kind of integrated medicine plus social interventions with community. Now, my part is going to kind of come to a close and I'm going to pass it off to Dr. C to kind of take us through and talk about what that actually looks like um, in, a, in, a, in a larger picture and, and also maybe tease a little bit of what we hope module two will kind of get to do a deeper dive within, which is what's happening in these clubhouse or in these community based settings um, and how do we kind of then position them to be able to be good integrated care partners. So Dr. C, uh, I'm going to hand it off to you and uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kevin. That was really informative. Um, and there's a poll coming up, so please uh, please feel free to answer that as well. Um, so I, I'm going to try to make it, you know, really um, real for everyone what what the experience is like. Um, I spent uh, 15 years before coming to Fountain House at a community mental health agency that had, um, you know, a lot of different clinical services and, and housing for people with serious mental disorders. And um, one of the things I did was assertive community treatment, which is, uh, you know, some of you may know is a service that has a multidisciplinary team of psychiatrists, 
nurses, social workers, peer specialists, going out to the community to meet people where they're at. And um, we did a lot of work in both clinic settings and in these assertive community treatment or mobile home visit settings to bring together uh, primary care, uh, physical health care into these very behavioral health oriented uh, services. So to really uh, say, you know, we don't just care whether you're hearing voices or not, we care also uh, what your risk for heart disease is and that your leg is hurting and so forth. Um, but I will say that one of the, the things that I learned in this work was that the most effective way to help people to see the primary care uh, physician or, or the, the family doctor or GP um, was for me as a psychiatrist to help host a weekly lunch where, um, where many of our folks who really had limited access to food and to social interaction could come, you know, learn about wellness, have a great uh, Caribbean lunch, that's what we usually serve, and uh, sometimes do karaoke or a drumming circle or go to see a movie together. And that is really when we really brought people to meet the primary care doctor, to trust a doctor that maybe they would have otherwise you know, hesitated to see and get their leg pain or their asthma or their blood pressure taken care of. And that to me was really where the value of, of community lies. You need to bring, um, bring what people really care about employment, education, wellness, relationships, housing, um, if, if um, we're even going to have the conversation about blood pressure management and uh, uh, antipsychotic medication adherence and any of those things. And to me, you know, uh, a friend of mine once said that um, uh, um, assertive community treatment or actine was the uh, Ferrari of psychiatry that once you've driven it, you can't go back because it's so powerful to be able to see people in their homes and understand uh, what the social context is for how they're living and what, um, uh, what affects their health. But to me, um, there are other models, uh, models that I'm gonna talk about, including Clubhouse, that are the full luxury yacht with the bells and whistles because the power of working with a whole community of people to support each person who suffers from mental illness um, in achieving their personal recovery goals is incredible. Um, so just going through the next slide, um, uh, Jessica, we'll, we'll uh, uh, talk about some of the different kinds of community-based social supports that are out there. There are lots of different grassroots um, community-based organizations that have used peer-based social support. So when we say peer, that means somebody who has a lived experience of mental illness themselves um, that uses those uh, peers to provide a, a social uh, care system that is beyond just a doctor in an office um, talking about your blood pressure or talking about your voices. What, we've, uh, what these CBOs or community-based organizations have created are intentional recovery communities where Things are designed in these communities to support people in figuring out where they, where they can find a place of belonging, where they can feel needed, which is, a, I think, for many psychiatrists, a new concept in the care of people with serious mental illness. We always we, we think, I think, that um, people with severe mental disorders like schizophrenia, they need us. They need psychiatry. They need medication. They need housing. But I have learned as a psychiatrist when I need them, I, when I need people with serious uh, mental disorders to help each other and to help me to learn as well. And I think you'll hear from my colleague, Craig, um, who, who really has made that uh, very real for me. And um, what we want is for every pe person with serious mental disorders to fe feel like they belong somewhere because that helps them to move towards this sense of, 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 of being a full uh, cared about and a uh, person that cares about other people. And that really promotes recovery. There are many mod model, uh, models, uh, uh, you know, and I actually am in, uh, fairly new to the, to the clubhouse community. We're definitely going to talk um, in the, especially in the next two modules about uh, what clubhouse is. I'm here just to introduce it today to give a taste. Um, but there are other models out there. Um, in fact, the Trieste model 
um, in, in Northern, Northern Italy is one of the, um, the oldest and, and very well-respected model that actually helps people with serious mental disorders to find um, jobs and housing in the community um, so that every person is part of the Trieste community in a very real way and finds recovery in that manner. Uh, in India, um, perhaps, you know, I think Dr. Javed probably knows more about these, but there are vocational communities that support people as well. And there are online health communities where people with mental illness can participate and find a, a place in the virtual world of belonging. Um, in Massachusetts here in the United States, we have the Gold Farm as well, a place where um, it's a farm and people with mental illnesses who, who live there can participate fully in the operation of the farm and find uh, their recovery through nature and uh, you know, through, through work uh, in that way as well. Uh, next slide, please. What I know most about and, and the, the members of the panel probably know most about is uh, the clubhouse model, which is now almost 75 years old. Um, in 1948, um, uh, that was a time when many state hospitals, state psychiatric hospitals in uh, the US closed. Um, after we uh, found uh, chlorpromazine and other medications and people got uh, a little bit better, uh, we, we believed as psychiatrists that uh, folks could, should, could and should move into the community. And unfortunately, we did not build a good enough system uh, of care to receive those folks. And so a lot of people ended up leaving the state hospital and but living um, sometimes in the streets and in very isolated circumstances. But four people who had left um, uh, the Rockland Psychiatric Hospital uh, created a support group for themselves um, called We Are Not Alone or WANA. And that began, became the clubhouse um, uh, model. Uh, that From that uh, sprung the building that you see a picture of that uh, today. That's Fountain House where I'm sitting right now. Um, and it has been a community of people with uh, serious mental disorders who support each other with the help of a few staff, but largely run and operated by people with serious mental disorders. Um, here in New York City. Um, the principles of social recovery, uh, social practice, excuse me, and recovery will be discussed further um, in our next modules. But ultimately, what happens in, inside the clubhouse, you know, we've done a lot of work to define because we talked about the magic of it for a long time. And um, uh, what it really is, is that we, we have a non-hierarchical environment in this clubhouse. So, uh, you know, Craig and I are colleagues, for instance, we, uh, uh, we work side by side to create this training um, and to uh, make sure that uh, all of the slides are, 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 are correct and to deliver this uh, to all of you at, 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 through the WPA. Um, and uh, so staff and members uh, work to, to create the clubhouse and to keep it running together um, in a non-hierarchical way. And the, uh, everyone, both staff and members works to involve everyone that comes into the clubhouse in a way where every person feels that they can contribute, that they are needed there, and that they have um, meaning and a place um, in the clubhouse. The relationships that we build through participation in this community help us all to recover. It's helped me to grow as a person and it helps the members to, uh, to find their place as well. And then, you know, you'll hear about more about this later, but that's re resulted in all kinds of outcomes where people do not need to be hospitalized as much. They find support here and so do not need to go to the emergency room. They find housing and um, there's healthy food so that they can recover physically. There's a gym so people can work out. And all of these things support um, every person's recovery in, in a very holistic way. Um, so the, the focus when someone comes into the clubhouse is not on the voices or the depression or, um, or, or the mania, even though those things are certainly things that we provide care for. The focus is on um, what people's talents are. The paintings on, you know, and, and art behind me are uh, made by uh, Fountain House members. Uh, so what really shines is their talent and ability to sell their art. Um, you know, you'll hear from Craig about his brilliant writing as a journalist and, and how that's been how I know Craig uh, 
uh, you know, just as much as the fact that he's a member, I, I know him through his, his really wonderful writing. And so every person's strengths are emphasized rather than their illness. And so that's just a taste of what you're going to hear in the next couple of modules. Um, but now I will just give you, it's hard to talk uh, and, and understand the, the Clubhouse module, uh, um, model from uh, just talking about it. So we're going to show you a video from uh, Magnolia House in Ohio that's uh, run by uh, uh, Dr. D'Angelo, who's on, on the panel with us. Um, so uh, Jessica, if you could play the video. Inside a stately, historic home on Magnolia Drive. I was on medication in a psychiatric ward. John Selman is getting a second chance. I thought my life was hopeless. As a matter of fact, I thought I would never get out of that situation. How are you doing today? Good. Good. Good, Good Kevin. The former engineer, now in his 60s. Okay, the second right here. Finding his path out. Let's go down. Yep. At Magnolia Clubhouse in Cleveland. Magnolia Clubhouse is a club for people that live with mental illness. Each day, this is a bar. Members like John work alongside mental health professionals on staff. I think that captures March to keep the club operational. And through that natural method. All right, how's that going, Jaleesa? Of being needed and working together. Okay. Okay. People grow and recover. Type attendance is wrong. Is there anything you want to sign up for? Executive Director Lori D'Angelo tells me. Thank you both. Only half of the people living with mental illness get treatment. So people live in isolation. And when they do seek out help, it's primarily medication. And the doctor was giving me medication, but it, it, it didn't help. Because you needed this. I needed the involvement. I needed the social interaction. Here, we're going to go ahead and do a uh, control. For the last seven months. We have to mark that as a completed. So let's scroll down a little bit. Oldest to newest. John has been partnered up with Kevin Van. Oldest to new. There's confidence. There's more hope. You see this drop down right here? Seeing that change in John since his arrival, creating a ripple effect of positivity. All borders right here. All right, so go ahead and use a mouse. It just motivates me and inspires me to um, do my work better and also engage with the, uh, the members here on our unit for sure. So Jeanette, you can go ahead and you guys can start recording. More than 400 people come through the clubhouse every year. Everybody learns at their own pace. Every day is building community and recovery and mental health. There you go. Use it one. I think you're good. No longer the newbie, John is giving tours of the clubhouse. As I know they're suffering inside. I see their pain. I have empathy. The depression, anxiety, and panic attacks that once overwhelmed John, now a thing of the past. And if I can help someone else to come into the clubhouse and be happy as how I am happy now, now that's a great opportunity for me. John tells me he's grateful for good health, family, and the Magnolia Clubhouse. Those are the things that is helping me now to move forward in my life. I think that's good. Good. Reporting in Cleveland. Can you go ahead and save it? Mike Brookbank, News 5. Okay. Yep. Control S. Control S. Thank you. I hope um, one of the things you, you notice when you watch that video is not only how uh, much uh, the member uh, uh, is benefiting from um, being part of it and offers to other members, but also the staff, how much uh, they enjoy their work and how much they get out of being part of this community too, because it's certainly something that I've, um, I've felt for myself. And um, I now have the pleasure to introduce Craig Bayer, who I've already talked up, <laughs> you know, to talk about his experience and to teach us about Clubhouse. Thank you, doctor. Uh, I just wanted to briefly describe the socially oriented process of recovery for a Fountain House member. Uh, it, uh, just sort of like a day in the life of a Fountain House member. Uh, uh, we start with our morning meeting where we distribute and organize the tasks for the day. And we also engage in some socialization. Uh, we're thinking, we find out what people are thinking and feeling and what their state of mind is. And then we move into the work-oriented day. In the, in the communications unit, we have data entry, we have phones, we have mail, uh, we have collating the paper or writing for the paper, all sorts of accessible tasks. And the significance of all this is that the staff and members are working side by side on all the tasks, whether they're administrative or clerical or creative. Uh, all these tasks help build a, a member's confidence 
And they also build trust uh, amongst the members and the staff and the members amongst themselves. This, this trust is vital towards people's recovery. Uh, I think the work is the secret of the clubhouse personally, uh, not just for professional reasons, because obviously you're taught, you're brought back into the workforce in a gradual manner, but you also have a great deal of socialization involved in the work because uh, if you're a wallflower, for instance, and you're not very a social being to begin with, your work can help distinguish you and help build your social network. I know from being published in the Fountain House Times, people know me and praise me for my writing and that that has helped build my social network as much as uh, you know, just going to a pure social club way. Um, I think uh, we have plenty of accessible work, as I stated, but we also have sophisticated work like the work I'm doing right now, where, we, where I help to co-create and co-present, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, curriculum for this presentation. And uh, the clubhouse also promotes other growth opportunities uh, that, that go beyond just doing busy work. Uh, I've been spoken at national conferences. I, I founded an international clubhouse journal called Roar, which helps promote the clubhouse around the world. Uh, I've taught and, and learned a lot about clubhouse with other clubhouses, and that's led to travel opportunities. Uh, going all the way from Cleveland to United Kingdom to Norway, where I've uh, helped promote the clubhouse and the clubhouse model. And, I've, and just the travel itself is an exciting challenge in itself. It's, it's not exact, it involves some work, a little bit of courage and bravery and stuff like that. And uh, then uh, lastly, I've done some what we call transitional employment at the clubhouse, where you're put into a real work environment. I worked at a law firm where I scanned documents for them and did all the clerical work. And uh, that work uh, helped prepare me for the uh, next step, which is to go into paid work. So uh, all, all these opportunities have been transformative for me and uh, have greatly benefited me. So, uh, and, and benefits the other members of the clubhouse. So that's basically what I have to say about the clubhouse model. Thank you so much, Craig. And you know, thank you for all your contributions to this work. Um, so uh, I, I think now we have a panel discussion, um, so I will ask uh, Jessica to lead us in that. Thank you. For those of you that have questions you would like to ask, please submit your questions in the Q&A pane, the icon of which can be located on the bottom of your Zoom window. Kevin will help moderate today's Q&A session. Kevin, the first question for today um, is, can you speak more about the adaptation plan as of successful clubhouse models in other countries, especially low to middle income? Mm -hmm. um, I think I'll pass that over to Dr. D'Angelo uh, to answer. Thanks, Kevin. Um, the model is very universal and it's been adapted all around the world. I think that the core of, of what is presented is able to be done everywhere. So there may be adaptations in the details, but there are standards that define the model. And it may take time, for example, to develop employment opportunities. They may vary in some cultures. The amount of funding may vary, but there are um, clubhouses that are very modest, modestly funded. And I know Dr. C mentioned that Fountain House is the luxury model <laughs> and the model itself. I think the luxury is the um, comprehensiveness of it, but that is able to be replicated in various cultures uh, all around the world and in, with various methods. I wanna just say that the luxury to me is just the number of relationships and opportunities that's offered by a community of people versus even just the 10 people on an, on an assertive community treatment team. <laughs> so. yeah, absolutely. And Kevin mentioned the workforce um, development in different cultures. And that's one of the, I think, benefits of the model. It's adaptable to whatever providing people there are and including primarily the peers, people with lived experience as a part of the workforce. Yeah, and I think we also want to emphasize that in bringing community partners as a pillar to integrated care strategies, if that's what you have primarily in your setting, you can start building a an integrated care system around those community care partners. They're not just passive or adjacent kind of, you know, things that are a part of the care network. 
we really want to bring them into kind of a, a similar footing of the psychiatric and medical care systems and that you can even begin an integrated care strategy in places or making the case for integrated care resources from the, even if what you have as your starting point is those community kind of lay professional or kind of even family oriented or vocational support systems already in place. The infrastructure can start from there and doesn't necessarily have to require, you know, the complex kind of health care that you might be an expectation of a psychiatric or medical care. Move on to the next question. What is the added value of adding a community component to our current medical practices? If we have, um, if we do not have a clubhouse, which type of community program or service is essential to helping the patient and the physicians? Um, I, I'll pass that to Dr. C um, to maybe answer given her experience. And I'm sure maybe Dr. Puniche might have something to say um, on that le level too. Sure. I mean, I think I talked uh, about just uh, my experience uh, in a place that wasn't a clubhouse, but where um, hosting a lunch, you know, can be a, a, the, the place to start. I think importantly, when we're building community uh, resources, creating a space where people can be together to socialize, to break bread together, to really um, uh, uh, you know, find a place and, and find their people um, is important. I think what I would say um, are important directions to take um, if you're thinking about moving towards the clubhouse model is, you know, importantly, that lunch may not be part of like necessarily a day program where people attend groups and, and, and so forth in therapy. And instead, part of a place where people can find work, can participate, can serve the lunch, can choose the menu, uh, can choose you know, whether, whether healthy things go on the menu. And really then um, that lunch becomes, uh, you know, a, what we, we would call a pocket, pocket clubhouse or a pocket environment where um, we really want everyone to feel part of the process and not just as a recipient. So I think um, if you don't have a clubhouse in your community and um, you're, you're thinking about like, how can people with serious mental disorders or serious mental illness, you know, um, find recovery in this place? I think that's a place to start. Think about um, the intention behind what, um, why they're, they're here with you and how to involve everyone in, um, uh, in the event that you're, you're offering. Uh, Francesca, did you have anything to add to that? Or? Um, no, I think you captured it really beautifully. I think um, some of the other questions that are also coming in really addressing, you know, as we work together in a non-hierarchical environment with members and folks side by side, one of the questions that keeps coming up is, is there a mode of um, reimbursement or payment given to members uh, who are working in the clubhouse? And how does this work within this model? Uh, one of the core principles of this model is that work is central to the community in bridging um, connection, coming together over projects. And these projects are shared ideas, activities. Um, and so I was thinking, you know, in terms of your benefits and experiences, Craig, and also Lori as a director, um, how do you address these kinds of questions when they come from the community and also professionals who work within the boundaries of a profession in terms of confidentiality and thinking about, you know, this model is really designed to create the need to be needed without exploitation and cohort coercion. So if um, Craig or Lori would like to speak to that. Well, I will give my piece about that. Um, the unpaid uh, aspect of the clubhouse, uh, work, members are not paid, of course, uh, to work in the clubhouse. Uh, it, 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 if if it were a payment situation, the entire concept of the clubhouse would change because, because the uh, most important thing of being a Fountain House member is choice, 
you choose your schedule, you choose the tasks that you want to work on. Uh, everything that everything that you do is voluntary, and including uh, whether you even show up on, on a daily basis. If it were a paid job, obviously you'd have obligations which you might not want to or be able to handle, um, and, and uh, you can literally be fired from Fountain House for uh, not working uh, in, to earn your pay. So uh, that's basically the, the clubhouse model in a nutshell. You're, you're, you're there to contribute to the community. You're there to engage your own recovery. You're not there for financial gain. Excellently said, Craig. And I think the other piece to add is that our goal is to help people reintegrate into the broader community. So we're helping people get paying jobs in the world like everybody else. We don't wanna limit people's opportunities. We wanna expand them. Uh, I will also just add, there's an aspect where uh, we'll get into this with module two in the clubhouse, but the principles of social practice is that you're also trying to, the work that you're interacting with is not just like limited or kind of closed work, but you're literally maybe sometimes, and we, we call our staff social practitioners, you're sometimes trying to work yourself out of your own job by giving that responsibility or that role back to the members to run it for themselves in their own community, to become stakeholders decision makers and participants, not just in a kind of passive way or just like in a, like I need something to do with my hands, but to actually then take over the the role and the, the kind of community directive um, as an entirety. And that's from day one, uh, maybe when someone maybe doesn't know all the kind of intricacies and the ways to navigate the clubhouse to people that have been members for decades. Um, and, uh, and, and they, and maybe they don't have as cute a needs as they once did, but they persist to come back because it's, it's like their second living room. It's the thing that helps them stay well. And, but they also still feel that it's a place where they can, um, contribute and also, uh, not just be there to receive services, but to maybe even be providers themselves to take over that role. I just want to add one thing to that too, Kevin, the experience of, for members of working isn't the same thing as it is in a job in, the, in, in another company, for example, because it's the vehicle for the rehabilitation. So it's the practical thing that's happening. But as Kevin was describing, the staff are working with the person and addressing intentionally how to best promote their achievement of their goals. So it's a therapeutic interaction and different than just working. Yeah, it's like the work is a vehicle for relationship development more so and developing a shared history of accomplishments that can be looked back upon, maybe counteract previous histories of, you know, diminished sense of accomplishments. And, you know, now we did this together, right? And it changes a whole new social history and projected trajectory. What I am able to do, what I'm able to do with others that I have others imagined in my future. I mean, we'll talk more about that in module two. We're kind of, you know, but, but how that we see it as keenly therapeutic, not just addressing social circumstances, but like also the, um, the, the a lot of the conditions and maladaptive maybe belief systems that maybe certain people um, have gotten uh, exposed to or had histories with that can be counteracted through those interactions in the clubhouse. Great, our next question came in for Craig. Craig, what does the clubhouse add that other experiences and your mental health recovery neglected? Well, uh, I would say that uh, it adds uh, it adds a structure to my day. It adds uh, structure to my goals and dreams. Um, when I was not in the clubhouse, uh, I was found myself not not you know almost unknowingly trying to build a fountain house. I was I was in a, a residence for a very long time, about ten years, and we tried to create a we created a tenants association. We tried to create a community where people were educating each other and trying to you know, uh, promote independence amongst mental people with mental health issues. And it was a very complicated situation to do it all on your own without, without the money or the structure of a clubhouse. Uh, it, it got complicated. The, the administration was not always cooperative, which is something that the Fountain House is very different about. Uh, it, they actually want to work with people with mental illness. They don't want to you know, basically degrade us or exploit us or just leave us in our apartments to suffer in isolation or drink beer or watch, you know, 24 hours worth of uh, law and order. So uh, it's, it's basically um, a very, uh, you know, healthy, it's a healthier situation 
than than uh, than than the uh, modes I've I've been subjected to in uh, in other in other forms of recovery. Thank you, Craig. And I think we're going to dive a little bit deeper. Another one for you. Um, congratulations to everyone on the launch. My question is for Mr. Bayer. What role does the clubhouse play in your day to day? And how does it fit within an integrated care approach? So maybe everyone can chime in as well. Well, on a day to day basis, I, I am there, you know, pretty much five days a week, 40 hours a week. Um, and uh, that, that is an important part of my day, of course. Uh, it's my job, basically, it's my mission. And uh, therefore it provides me with a purpose in life and it pr provides me with uh, um, a vehicle for my own political and artistic goals. So that's, that's uh, the most important thing about Fountain House. Um, I, I, what, what was the second part of the question? Certainly, and how does it fit within an integrated care approach? Well, uh, the Fountain House uh, obviously uh, has a relationship with uh, its, its psychiatric wing. Uh, you know, there was a time when clubhouses did not get deeply involved with uh, the clinical services, but in the Fountain House model now, uh, we have a clinic and that, that clinic has psychiatrists and therapists who uh, contribute to the clubhouse model uh, approach? Uh, they, they're, they're familiar with we. They're familiar with uh, the uh, clubhouse model. They respect it. They care about it. They they care about the the dignity of the members. Um, and uh, you know the the psychiatrist uh, can basically have a better picture of his patient uh, through the clubhouse model because you have the support the, you have the support of the staff. And the membership of the clubhouse who knows who know when a member is doing well or doing poorly, uh, and as a result, that 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 interaction between the psychiatrist and the clubhouse uh, aids in the recovery, as opposed to uh, having a diminished uh, role in the recovery, where you're just seeing the psychiatrist for say 30 minutes a, a month. You know, it's it's very different for the psychiatrist when they have the information gathered by the clubhouse. Yeah, I might uh, cl clarify as part of that that um, um, clubhouses for clubhouses, psychiatry does not exist as part of the clubhouse. I, I think Found House is one of the very few of hundreds of clubhouses that has a medical director, and that would be me. Um, but my job is primarily to connect, make sure that uh, members are connected to outside clinical services uh, whenever they need them. So, uh, for instance, I work at a clinic down the street that is not part of Fountain House, but that um, uh, has really high quality psychiatrists who serve Fountain House members in addition to the community there. And um, Dr. Ralph Aquila had also uh, developed another clinic um, uh, that we, we still partner with, um, with uh, that provides um, psychiatry, primary care and therapy as well. But uh, um, uh, inside the clubhouse, um, we do not provide uh, psychiatric care because we want this to be a place where people belong in their community and find uh, uh, work and other uh, parts of, of, of uh, community uh, um, participation. Um, and the clinical space uh, is outside, though we support that connection. Um, all that to say, I think, um, the third module of this series really focuses on this question. Really, uh, um, I think we're going to dive deep into the relationship between psychiatrists and, um, and, and community-based organizations like clubhouses and how they can mutually benefit and actually uh, develop integrated care through their partnerships. Thank you, Dr. C. So we do have a question for Dr. Doherty. You mentioned your great experience at Fountain House. Could you tell us what, in your opinion, is unique about the clubhouse model? That's a great question and a really hard question. I think the unique thing for me, and it connects a little bit to the question that, that we've just had about the role of the psychiatrist, is was the experience of being welcomed in to a community to a space as an equal with no 
with no sort of worries or concern about what my role and the power attached to psychiatry and the things we've done, how that would influence relationships. It was being in, invited into a space um, where people were being themselves. People were looking after each other, um, building their lives and developing their lives in a complete turn to how you often see sort of standard mental health services delivered where the professionals are bestowing on you care or helping you do something. It's the, it's the complete flip to that. And it's very, very hard to explain unless you, I think, unless you visit and you go and spend time in a clubhouse, because it really does turn the table on that. This is not about people needing to sort of benefit or have care bestowed on them. It's about making sure that the supports and the environment and the ethos is there for people to flourish um, and, and build on their skills without being, you know, stuff being done to them. I think to me, that is the, the distinct different feeling of when you go into a clubhouse versus pretty much any other mental health service that I've ever been in. Thank you. The next question is what involvements have members had in creating this curriculum? Well, I can certainly address that because I did help create it. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the initial discussions about this curriculum I was involved in, uh, there are parts of the curriculum, written parts, which I took part in. And uh, basically, uh, you know, my approval was as important as anybody else's in terms of making clear what this curriculum is about. Great, the next question, what do you consider a central component of the clubhouse model in supporting psychiatrists? Uh, I'm gonna give that one to Dr. C. Um, to start us off with. And if others have other contributions, that'd be great. Sure. Again, I'm going to do that in like 30 seconds, but you really should come to our third module because we're going to talk about that for almost, a, you know, an hour. Um, because I think there's a lot of um, uh, different ways, but definitely, I think um, it, it was, I think it was Craig that said, um, when, when I can understand somebody as a whole person, what they offer, what's important to them, how other people see them, what they mean to other people. That changes the entire game of how you provide care. Because the goal then is not just like, let's get these voices to zero, you know, um, or it, it, it becomes like, how can I help someone like Craig to be the best writer, artist, karaoke organizer, um, cook, um, uh, you know, uh, law office clerk that they can be, right? Um, how, how can I help this person to find a partner, which is what they want? You know, that, that becomes like, when you think about like, what medication am I gonna pre prescribe? Or, you know, what level of housing does this person need? That becomes the calculus. And um, as a psychiatrist, I think that's a very powerful way to work. And to be not alone in my office, trying to guess what's going to happen with this person after you know, 15, 30 minutes of seeing them, what's going to happen for the next whole month. But to know that this person is part of a community that has their back, um, that helps me to reduce the amount of medication I'm going to prescribe. It helps me to, to feel safe that um, this person is going to flourish because, um, because it, it's not just me alone. I am not alone as a psychiatrist. You know, we are not alone as psychiatrists when we have um, community-based organizations like clubhouses supporting our work. So to me, that's where it, it, it sits. But come back to the third module to learn more. <laughs> I just wanted to add that, uh, you know, I, have, I am being a psychiatric patient, of course, I'm on psychiatric drugs. Uh, one of the reasons I'm on them is to deal with depression. 
Uh, depression does, does not lift simply because you've taken a, a, a pill. Uh, depression is what it lifts more likely when you have purpose in life, when you have a goal in life, when you're pursuing something that you enjoy that's fulfilling. Uh, that's, that's just as important as getting medication. Yeah, I would really echo that. Um, and, and my prior role as a social practitioner, you really see that it's the accumulation of kind of everyday experiences and then those experiences leading to goals that then inform how that member or anyone wants to interact with the other healthcare providers. Oh, I met some people, they're going out to the movies this weekend. I actually am on a fixed income right now and I'd like to get some more money so that I can go enjoy these things. Can you help me get a job? Oh, I got that job, but I can't seem to be staying awake for eight hours straight because I feel like I'm, I'm having too much. Can we, can we go and talk to the psychiatrist and the psychiatrist and ra rather than just going off the drugs, maybe all together because you want to meet that you know, or something. And it's like that then informs the conversation with the psychiatrist by from a relationship to a goal to then an interaction with the healthcare system. And that like happens on like a, on a micro level and on like every single day. And you start accumulating that versus if all I'm going back to is a home where I'm either alone or isolating, you don't maybe have some of that decision-making or, or kind of perspective, kind of goal orientation informing, or even having the psychiatrist be able to have that inform the things that they want um, and is communicated for um, by, the, by the member for what they're trying to achieve. Module three though, definitely we'll talk more about it. I wanna emphasize that. <laughs> Thank you. The next question, what is the mode of payment given to the members who are working in the clubhouse? Is it just free medicine? Uh, Dr. D'Angelo, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, I think we kind of did before. There is no payment given to members in the clubhouse. And, and the, psychi the psychiatric care is usually funded through insurance, medical government insurance of some form usually. So this may pigtail off of that, Lori, and Dr. C, you can chime in as well. Where do clubhouses get their funding? Primarily government funding. I would say that's pretty true across the world. Um, private funding is raised and the government funding can come in various ways, um, but it's most often a challenge. And I think, you know, uh, I, I, others on this call um, have much more familiarity, but uh, um, I think around the world, there are different models, um, but there are different levels of what, what the clubhouse bells and whistles are, are like uh, Lori mentioned as well. Um, but I think that, um, you know, one thing I wanted to add uh, was that in fact, at Fountain House, um, members pay for their, their breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, there's no free lunch here, you know, so um, the, the lunch is very healthy, uh, balanced, wonderful lunch, but it's $1.50, uh, or you can get a really great uh, salad for 75 cents, but you pay because you're a member of the community, and you come and contribute, and um, you contribute your $1.50 as well for lunch, so um, I think that's an important difference than um, many services we see, because we, we want members to feel like uh, they contribute and they're, they're valid members of the, of the, the community too. They're, they're not here just uh, as recipients of, of some kind. Uh, speaking about funding and, and kind of connecting it back to module one and building the case for community care partners as a part of um, what comprehensive care integrated strategies are, you you start and maybe making the case that um, we can build new funding lines for community-based programs that are can be connected to those maybe more traditional systems of care rather than them having to be independently funded as separate programs um, through either government insurance or private philanthropy or things of the sort. The more we're able to kind of get the larger global mental health community understanding that this is a core component integrated care strategies, then I think that seed grows into a larger kind of financing understanding and, and investment understanding that if you really want to meaningfully address this problem, you're not just going to put dollars into uh, uh, psychiatric or just medical care in isolation or connected without potentially also having a community component added into it. 
especially for serious or severe uh, mental disorders, because um, the, the needs go unmet quite often. And when those needs go unmet, they undermine the progress that you make in those other two components of care quite often. And so you, that so the, the financing is our circumstances are what you uh, are are what they are currently, but we see through a greater conceptualization of these integrated care strategies and this growing um, consensus and what we hope to accomplish in module one and these trainings that um, that that could be shifted and that can that can change and the paradigm can grow. And aside from promotion um, and awareness, what is the best technique so far in shifting from recovery paradigm coming from the traditional psych facility practices? Uh, I'm going to pass that one back to Dr. C real quick, but I'm sure others have some commentary about that, about that shift in the recovery paradigm. And, um... huh. If I understand the question correctly, then... Um... Maybe I'll just start by dis, uh, discussing the recovery paradigm as I experienced it. I think even when I was training, and that was um, that that was only fifteen to twenty years ago, um, we had just started to talk about recovery. We were still very illness focused and very much symptom focused um, uh, in in my training, and and uh, particularly I did a psychoanalytic training as well, and and um, it was really um, about understanding the pathology much more than about understanding the well part of the person. And I think that shift has really, you know, come over the last 20 years and has led psychiatry from being much, a much more paternalistic world um, of, unfortunately, like forced treatment and so forth, to one where we believe in and help every person to achieve their potential. And that is our role. So, um, to me, I've seen that transformation in the last 20 years and been really moved and, um, and motivated by it. Um, happy for others to jump in on that too. I certainly think that uh, the recovery paradigm for Clubhouse or integrated care, um, it's much more uh, patient-centered. Uh, as a matter, you know, um, I would say we play a more aggressive role in our recovery we're not entitlement personality people who just want services, demand services, demand pay for whatever we're doing. Uh, we're there to contribute to the community. Uh, we're there, you know, we do pay for our lunch. Uh, we, do, uh, we do work for free. Uh, it's not a degrading situation, contrary to what people might think. Um, and uh, basically, I would say that uh, we get more out of it because we're doing this not against our will. We weren't told to do this. We're there because we want to be there. We're there because we want to engage in our recovery. We approve of we, we approve of what's going on. We understand what's going on. Foundhouse has a lot of internal education about how Clubhouse works. Uh, it's not a mystery. It's not something that's going that that people are talking behind members' backs, trying to strategize on how to uh, hurt us this way or that way. Uh, it's basically. Uh, a situation where we understand what we're undergoing because we're not fools and we're not ignoramuses. And uh, as a result, uh, it's a much more effective recovery form. I, I wanted to add one slight side point, side point in as well, which is something again that really stuck with me when I visited was continuity in relationships. And one of the struggles that we have um, certainly in UK mental health services is that we're we're so overstretched that it's about getting people through and out the other end, as opposed to recognizing that, first of all, many of these conditions will be with you for a long time and there might be ups and downs and they might be exacerbated by changes in various things that might go on in life. Um, and the importance of continuity in relationships and things that extend beyond a six week program of this or a eight week program of that, um, I think are essential for recovery and relate to a fuller recovery concept, which is about um, you continuing to thrive and shift and change as life goes on. And as the, and the things that you're involved in and you know, what's happening in your relationship and what's happening in just your chronological period in life, that there is something consistent that moves along and is present with you um, and as an opportunity to stop 
I think what we have, which is this sort of cycle of you're passed down and up and you're stepped up and down systems, um, which is especially when one of the key things that is a recovery area is your ability to form relationships and trust and connect again, um, developing services that are about passing you through a system as much as there's of course an economic um, reason behind that feels comfortable in clang, uncomfortable in clangs. Mm -hmm. And I think where Dr. C was talking about where we have that shift and we're having a, a broader sense of what recovery means, I think now we're getting to it's like, how do you train that or how do you instantiate that in your operations? Do you centralize all those components now within one institution? Like our psychiatrists now supposed to be community providers of community interventions, as well as medical, as well as, you know, behavioral health. Do you like centralize these things or do you build a network of partners that have certain roles and responsibilities that are quite tightly integrated, um, right? So if you have that kind of person-centered ac activity, and I think there are some efforts within trainings that it says, oh, we need to be more of this. And we need to be the total package here in this one place, right? Or in this one kind of program of so to speak and you know that's one of the things i think continued research on these strategies will kind of get to identify is um what is the kind of you know distinctions that you're having between the certain kind of service provisions you're having the types of coordination and are you trying and the roles and responsibilities right you know as dr c alluded that clinical services don't get provided in the clubhouse but they're tightly connected to adjacent clinical services right next door to them what does it look like if you try to all of a sudden mix those two together right does that diminish the impact or do you need to kind of look at those bright lines and we'll get to talk a little bit about that in module three about how you, although the recovery paradigm maybe have grown what does that then look like in our practices right if we want to account for all these comprehensive care components and does that look like a vertical integration or does that look like a more horizontal closer kind of tight knit of, of partners you know we'll, we'll get to kind of explore that um, and we think that's a really compelling question and and, and we, we agree with the growing sentiment but we also think that there's a really good way to enact that sentiment and, and to do it and, and to meet the, uh, the call to action effectively. Um, and yeah, so we'll, we'll get to explore that in the later modules. I just want to add too that I think that the recovery paradigm has grown in all the ways people described. And I think people work together more in partnership and it's more individually centered. But I think what's still the challenge is that oftentimes people working with people with mental illness, if they are even doing that, don't see people at their best. They often see people at their worst. So the expectation or realization of how much people can gain and grow and what people can accomplish is still kind of an unknown um, reality. And I think that's where people talking about their experience like Craig is doing today and are helping to train people to under in education to understand what's possible is really important part of all of this. The more public that message can get, the better. And I think some of the statistics that we can provide, for example, what proportion of people are working and how people feel about their lives after having the opportunities to um, achieve more of their potential is still a message we have to help get across. Thank you. That does wrap up our Q&A session for today. So thank you all for your questions. Dr. C, I'll pass it back to you for closing remarks. Thank you. I want to thank all the panelists and especially our guest, uh, Dr. Dogerty, for uh, joining us today and um, providing their insights. I really hope that everyone enjoyed this talk. Thank you for coming. And thank you for considering the role of community-based organizations in your work and in your community. We hope that um, more people can access a good quality mental health care and psychosocial care for the whole person um, because of uh, the work that all of these community-based organizations and you are doing. We really hope to see you again. I register for modules two and three. Module two, we'll talk about um, what the clubhouse is in more detail. And module three, the relationship between psychiatric providers and um, uh, community-based organizations. Uh, so I hope to see you soon. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you. For those that have a question um, that there was not answered today, you can certainly email your questions over to PIC, pick at fountainhouse.org. An upload of this webinar will be made available on Fountainhouse in the coming days.
Thank you all for joining and have a wonderful day. You may now disconnect.